Good morning. Good morning, sir. I won't say I'm a great speaker, but when a whole battalion comes a thousand miles from Miami to hear me speak, that's pretty amazing, isn't it? <laughs> it's good to be back. It's been a long journey here. I think it was three weeks we've been gone here. And um, things are, my life, things are kind of blending together here. And I'm never sure what I shared previously on things on deployment or or whatever, but I think I've got, I think I've got my timeline correct here. So I'll just kind of update you on some neat things that happened uh, while we were gone there, and um, just that you can be praying for as well. I pray. I mentioned a fella um, in our share time there a little bit that I'm thankful for the opportunities to be able to share Christ, uh, to see people come to Christ, and just be part of that process. A uh, fellow by the name of Nick <clears throat> went out for ice cream uh, Monday night with a group of men. Just They invited me randomly to come along, walk down to downtown, had some great ice cream, something I shouldn't be eating, but anyhow, I did. And um, nice visit, and then the next night they invited me again. But I didn't realize it was a, they're really inviting, uh, doing something special for their team lead, just honoring him for the great leadership he had done. And I really didn't belong in that group there. And as I sat there, I thought I'm kind of a, I'm a missing, I'm a, I'm a piece that in this grand puzzle here that really is not part of that group here. But I just kind of listened. And then I just felt led as we were sitting there in the quietness of the evening there to ask, yeah, I'd be curious on how each person came to Christ. Uh, long and the short of it is, as each person shared, and it was interesting, a number of these people had come out of a uh, background of Catholicism, and the fellow that shared there, as we were about three quarters of the way through, just shared, well, I just, uh, I just, um, I, I like God, I've had a, you know, I, I just want to do things for God and, and help people, and um, I just pray that that will be enough uh, as I as I know God. It was very apparent. It was a works-based philosophy, again, uh, Catholic-type background there. And as we were going back, uh, a couple of guys kind of uh, grabbed me and said, hey, I don't think Nick really knows the Lord. And here he was volunteering uh, with Samaritan's person. And I agreed, and I was praying, Lord, prompt one of these men to share with this fella, you know, <laughs> before he leaves, which was the next, which was two days later. And uh, so the next night came around, the Lord just convicted me and saying, you know, again, not this, here am I, Lord, send Aaron, but maybe, maybe God is prompting me to share with them. So um, there's a group of men around the table. It was very apparent he wasn't going to be isolated. So I just kind of started nudging him a little bit, talking about things. And um, I asked him that question. Um, Nick, I'm just curious, if you were to die today, stand before God, and God would say, why should I let you to my heaven? What would you answer? And um, again, it was a works-based response. But significantly, there was a fellow I had met earlier in the week, a very quiet guy, an engineer, who, who readily admitted to me he's kind of a, a nerd, an introvert engineer, and he doesn't talk much. But we still had a, a nice conversation together, was sitting on the other side. And as the time went on, he was sharing, as I shared, and what I missed, he built on, and maybe something um, he said I could build on. And so both of them were, just, both of us were like bookends, just sharing Christ with this individual. Across the table happened to be one of the guys that was there the night before at the ice cream parlor. He knew exactly what was going on, a former pastor. And I saw him quietly dismiss himself, and I knew he was gonna be praying. Long and the short of it is, uh, Nick came to put his faith in Christ, which was just really, really exciting. And uh, even, even just as exciting was as he left and um, I had a chance to talk to Chris, the other fellow, later, he was just pumped. He was, he was giving him, trying to find material and that sort of thing. And he says, Marv, he says, I have never done that before. He says, I'm 51 years old and I've never led anyone to Christ. That's the neatest thing I've ever done. And that was exciting, um, just to see not only a person coming to Christ, but an opportunity to have someone else be a part of that process. So pray for Nick, exciting time. The battalion was there, and um, they, they uh, were just great. Um, knocking your socks off, it doesn't sound very spiritual, but that's kind of what they did there. They just had a, a huge impact on not only the volunteers, but certainly 
those we served. I just heard endless compliments and encouragement. Um, I ended up with a team of about eight. The rest were deployed to other teams. And um, when I had a big job and I needed some of them back, it was just like, nice try, but they're staying on our team, Marv. And that was that. You know, it's just, it's, in fact, uh, they kept peeling people off my team. So it was just an incredible experience. Uh, thank you, guys. You left a, a powerful message to the people there. A lot of them had never worked with uh, alert guys before. And uh, thank you for your testimony. These guys readily mixed it up with other people. I just asked them to do that. And every meal, I could count on at least two or three guys at a separate table uh, just visiting uh, with some of the people there. And you could just tell by the eye contact, the interaction, and uh, the impact they made, not only for that deployment, but I really believe for eternity. So thank you, guys. Uh, you did a, a great job there. and. Uh, Good to be back. It's a towering stretch there, but um, it is good to be back uh, sharing with you. We're looking at the life of Elijah a little bit here. We're going to build on a message that um, maybe I shared, I don't know, it was at the reunion, I guess. So it was a number of weeks ago already here. And if you remember that, um, and if, or if you don't, I'll just kind of refresh your memory there. We have Elijah uh, coming upon the scene and unlike, again, a lot of people in Scripture, where there's a little buildup, you know, his dad, his granddad, his, his great-grandfather, that sort of thing there. He just appears, and not only appears, but immediately gives a message to Ahab. There's going to be a drought and famine there. And then, as you remember, God moves him out. He moves in the wilderness, the, uh, the brook Cherith, if you will. Cherith having the connotation of a cutting place, Almost a picture of God now wants to do some surgery on Elijah in the quietness and in the hiddenness and living in obscurity. That was the key word there, living a life in obscurity. So that's Elijah then. He's living in hiddenness. And the only, the only big events mentioned before he re-encounters um, Ahab is the widow at Zarephath where he, he blesses her with an overabundance of... Um, uh, or the miracle of, of oil to provide for her son and herself there. And then the second thing was uh, that significant moment when that very son uh, took ill and died and Elijah came back and was part of the process that God used him in raising this son from the dead. So he had some dramatic, uh, powerful moments, miracles, but unless we had seen those in Scripture, I doubt that many people were even aware of that because he lived in obscurity and hiddenness. And there's a message there in and of itself as well there. So, and again, it's just a reminder to us again that we live basically our lives here in quiet routine. Now, yes, we, we deploy and it's kind of a moment of excitement and, and you're on the big stage, if you will, there and sometimes you're talking to people. Several of our, at least, uh, I know our guys gave testimonies. Um, one or two of you guys, I think, gave devotionals, if I'm not mistaken, as well. <laughs> they were very, very good. I want to tell you, um, I think the people were just moved by what was shared there. So there's, there are those bigger stage moments, but yet for the most part, what? We live lives in obscurity. If you're not here, you're working a job, maybe eight to 12 hours a day in the office. You might be crunching numbers. You might be a homeschool mom, just diligently doing your thing with those days of saying, am I getting anywhere? I'm frustrated. He won't respond. My, my son, Sam, who is uh, just the greatest guy, he was a he was a tough cookie when it came to the area of was it math. He just, he just wanted to know why certain things worked. And if he didn't understand why, it, it was like, um, I just can't accept that, you know. And I remember more than once getting a call from uh, Carl at work saying, uh, you need to talk to Sam. So I'd get on the line and I'd, I'd tell him in no certain business it works. And if his mom says it works, it works. So just do it type stuff. And he did. You know, he got it. And he is not like that anymore. Praise God there. So anyhow, that's lives we live though, isn't it? We're living lives in obscurity. We're also living lives that we face a lot of pain. I shared 
Uh, this story about um, Elliot uh, Trump here, um, cute little kid and just um, now in eternity and parents asking why here. We face hard things. We face wayward sons and daughters. We face the battles of, um, of addictions, of complacency, of getting caught up in temporal things there, all that sort of thing there. Um, these are hard things we go through. We go through boredom. And as we go through life, sometimes we go through struggles. It might be purposelessness. It might even be uh, battles with depression here. So as we continue to look at the life of Elijah, I think we're going to see these things. And I'm just going to point out some observations I made, uh, 12 or 13. I know that number sounds scary, but we'll hit them pretty quick here. And if you want to jot them down, that's fine. Or I can give you the notes or whatever there. But there's a number of observations that I can see in Elijah's life from the point of when he um, was first, again, called to obscurity, to the completion of Mount Carmel and uh, his running away from Jezebel, from Jezebel and then uh, the reappointment of having a, um, an associate come alongside him, Elisha. So, so let's pray and let's take a look at that. Father, thank you for your word. We thank you for men and women in scripture that uh, teach us so much and you use them. And sometimes it's easy to be critical of these people and wonder how they, they ended up where they did, but yet uh, these are real people. And um, in many ways, we are just like them. So teach us uh, through the life of Elijah and uh, let us do our own study of our own souls to see where we might be, battles we face in the past or are anticipating in the future, and that we may respond properly and appropriately to your spirit. In your name I ask this, amen. Why don't we, um, it might be good just to read the passage. Why don't we stand together and let's read 1 Kings 18 to uh, remind ourselves of the background here, where we're coming from, and um, see what God might have for us here today. Give you a minute there, 1 Kings chapter 18. <clears throat> And uh, how about, uh, can I get an alert guy just to read that real loud for us here? Okay, thank you, right there. Oh, got a microphone coming here. There we go. After many days, the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go, show yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain upon the earth. So Elijah went to show himself to Ahab. Now the famine was severe in Samaria, and Ahab called Obadiah, who was over the household. Now Obadiah feared the Lord greatly, and when Jezebel cut off the prophets of the Lord, Obadiah took a hundred prophets and hid them by fifties in a cave and fed them with bread and water. And Abraham said to o Ahab said to Obadiah, Go through the land to all the springs of water and to all the valleys. Perhaps we may find grass and save the horses and the mules alive and not lose some of the animals. So they divided the land between, the, between them to pass through it. Ahab went in one direction by himself and Obadiah went in another direction by himself. And as Obadiah was on the way, behold, Elijah met him. And Obadiah recognized him and fell on his face and said, it is, you, my, is it you, my Lord Elijah? And he said, to, and he answered him, it is I. Go tell your Lord, behold, Elijah is here. And he said, How have I sinned that you would give your servant into the hand of Ahab to kill me? As the Lord your God lives, there is no nation or kingdom where my Lord has not sent to seek you. And when they would say he is not here, he would take an oath of the kingdom or nation that they had not found you. And now you say, go tell your Lord, behold, Elijah is here. And as soon as I have gone from you, the spirit of the Lord will carry you. I know not where. And so when I come and tell Ahab and he cannot find you, he will kill me. Although I, your servant, have feared the Lord from my youth. Has it not been told my Lord what I did when Jezebel killed the prophets of the Lord? How I hid a hundred men of the Lord's prophets by fifties in a cave and fed them with bread and water. And how you say, go tell your Lord. And now you say, go tell your Lord. 
Behold, Elijah is here, and he will kill me. And Elijah said, As the Lord of hosts lives, before whom I stand, I will surely show myself to him today. So Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him, and Ahab went to meet Elijah. When Ahab saw Elijah, Ahab said to him, Is it you, you troubler of Israel? And he answered him, I have not troubled Israel, but you have, and your father's house, because you have abandoned the commandments of the Lord and followed the Baals. Now, therefore, send and gather all Israel to meet me at Mount Carmel, and the 450 prophets of Baal, and the 400 prophets of Asherah, who eat at Jezebel's table. Thank you. You can stop right there. You may be seated. Thank you. That's the background, again, of um, Elijah here. And I think the first observation I think we need to make goes back to what I just shared with introduction, is the fact that God writes the timelines in our life. God writes the timelines. We don't know what Elijah was thinking there when he was at uh, the Brook Cherith there in the quietness and doing the subtle things behind the scenes. But that was an important preparation time for Obadiah. And then it led us to this moment as we began reading here in chapter 18. God writes the timeline. He offers us, he presents us. Remember that first job you had? Uh, some of you here maybe did the military thing there. There was a marriage a timeline, or there was a point of marriage in our timeline, a point of parenthood, maybe a, a point of death in a parent we can look back to. And maybe there was a job loss. Maybe there's been a health diagnosis or prognosis that you know has left a, an important mark in our timeline there. God writes the timelines into everything there is a season. So we move now into chapter 18. And I think there's a second observation we make there. And I'll take it in alert terms there. <clears throat> and let's call it observation number two. Have your pack ready and your compass in hand. Now why am I saying that? Have your pack ready and your compass in hand. I want us to look for a moment here at the life of Obadiah. Now, there's a number of Obadiahs in Scripture. <coughs> Excuse me. I don't believe this is an Obadiah and uh, the minor prophets there. But nevertheless, here's an Obadiah that God placed in history there. Let's ask a question here. If God were today to ask you to serve under this present administration in Washington under the Biden administration, would you take that job? If God were asking you not only to work in the Biden administration, but work for the, is it the Secretary of Transportation, Budelig, I don't know how you pronounce his name there, here's a, a professing homosexual, would you work for him? Or would you say, no way, I'm not working for a liberal a party. I'm certainly not working for one that's uh, living life in perversion. But yet, consider Obadiah. We know what was going on in this kingdom, right? We have the worshipers of Baal. And Baal, Ashereth, these are fertility type gods. We're not talking about quiet loves and we're talking about perversion sexual activity that was just shameful type stuff. That's what these gods were, and that's the type of worship that was going on. Yet we find a man like Obadiah working in this administration. That's significant. A believer who feared God was literally in charge of the king's house. What sort of conversations do you think he was exposed to? Or things that maybe he caught out of the corner of his eye there. How did he navigate spiritual life day to day? Was it right for him to be there? Is your, if your answer is, no, you really shouldn't have. He should have stepped aside. He should have walked away and said, my calling is to purity. Then we have to ask questions about, what about Daniel? Daniel served in an important position. What about Queen Esther? What about Joseph? who worked for Pharaoh. I don't think Pharaoh was a worshiper of God there. God writes the timeline, and we need to understand that sometimes he may call us to a life that 
we might not expect. Now, again, I want to be careful here and, and fully understand that if, if you're approached to take a job as a bartender, I think it's a no-brainer. We definitely do not want to take employment that promotes uh, conduct that is detrimental to our Christian walk or to the family. But yet God may call us to work for that company or for that employer that is not a believer. And we can take the skills God has given us to serve him. We are called to be holy, for he is holy there. But God can use us to demonstrate that holiness to a, a volatile crowd sometime there. Don't be so quick to dismiss such thing there. Have your pack ready if the call is there, if the alarm goes off, if you will. But have your compass set on divine north there. Be ready to be that light. There's another interesting thing here as we look at the life of Obadiah, that Obadiah <clears throat> was selected by Ahab to run a search pattern, searching for water, searching for green grass, anything that might help the nation survive here. Obadiah surely lived a life that was different from most others in Ahab's kingdom there. He must have trusted Ahab, uh, uh, Obadiah when he called him to go with him. Here was the ruler of um, Ahab's household, but he saw something in Ahab that he trusted and then he believed in. He saw a strong character, a strong work worth ethic that made him a trusted employee. And again, as we go into these environments that are um, anti-Christian, if you will, their philosophies of companies, just make sure that you're living for the Lord Jesus Christ and your compass is set on divine north. It's also interesting that Obadiah was uh, the one that encountered Elijah. Now that's no coincidence and that's not bad luck because again, as Obadiah conversed with Elijah, Elijah said, hey, go tell the king I'm here. Obadiah said, you got to be kidding. He says, I'm going to go. You want me to leave and tell the king that I found you? And then the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God is going to move you somewhere else. And I'm going to go there. And the king is going to say, why in the world did you not bring him with you or that sort of thing here? But yet in God's divine providence, he had Obadiah encounter Elijah. Another interesting observation about Obadiah that it was the same Obadiah that, as we read in Scripture, took incredible risks behind the scenes. And he had how many people? 100 followers of the Lord, 100 prophets that were under the execution order of Queen Jezebel. Jezebel was the Hitler of her day there. And here's Obadiah not only hiding them, but continuing to provide for him, for them. That's no small task. Feeding a hundred people, that's a challenge. I look at Obadiah and I see, you know, there's parallels here between Obadiah and people like Corey and Betsy Tenboom who hid the Jews there, finding ration cars to continue to feed them. I don't know how Obadiah did it. How did he transport all that food there? Weren't there questions being asked? But we serve a powerful God, and somehow in God's power, he used an Obadiah to provide for these prophets. Have your pack ready, hold all things loosely, and set your compass on living life for the Lord Jesus Christ. We need Daniels. We need Obadiahs. We need Esthers in this world when we face the ongoing pressures of what is going on here. There's a third observation. Don't let others dictate the narrative. Remember, it says, Then it happened when Ahab saw Elijah, that Ahab said to him, Is that you, O troubler of Israel? And Elijah answered, I have not troubled Israel, but you and your fathers have, in that you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord and have followed the Baals. Ahab called Elijah the troubler of Israel, but Elijah turned that statement onto Ahab. It was Ahab that was causing the trouble by allowing a nation to worship Baal there. 
I think we need to be a people that speak truth. We need to confront those that are living in ungodliness, those that contradict God's laws. They are the real cause of the chaos in our world. Speak with love, speak with truth, speak with conviction. I'm just going to recommend a, a message I've listened to many times on, uh, you can get it on YouTube now, John MacArthur's message, We Will Not Bow Down. If you ever want to hear a message of firmness, but of love, I'd listen to that message and you'll get the picture of what I'm talking about here. We will not bow down. We will honor those in authority. We will pray for them, but we will not bow down to commands that are not in keeping with the word of God. Amen. Number four, there's another observation. It is God who controls the Mount Carmel experiences. Now, we're not going to go into detail on that. You're all familiar with that. There's this encounter. The, uh, the people are worshiping Baal and calling you know, down from heaven there. And then Elijah gets his opportunity to do such. He pours water on the altar, and then he calls down fire from heaven, and indeed everything is consumed in that whole experience there. But I think we need to remember that it is God who controls these Mount Carmel experiences. They are not common experiences. God still works in that way, and I'm thinking every one of us could testify to a testimony we've read over history where God worked in truly a miraculous, supernatural way. But I think we do need to remember that God is in control of those experiences, and we need to trust him as well. There's a fifth observation. Significant victories do not always change the trajectory of a nation or even a person's perspective. Turn to chapter 19 as we move past the Mount Carmel experience. Chapter 19, verses 1 through 3. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, also how he had executed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a message to Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, he arose and ran for his life and went to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servants there. Significant victories do not always change the trajectory of a nation or a person's perspective. You know, throughout history, we've seen those moments. We've seen Israel disciplined uh, countless times there. We see a repentance, or at least a form of repentance, and people coming back there. But yet, it's, uh, it's often very short-lived. You know, I think of, um, I love to, to study World War II there, and even going back to World War I, you look at the country of Germany. Here was Germany, lost World War I. Here was Germany, lost World War II. But yet, if you look at Germany today, a very, very callous nation, very little worship. I mean, all of Europe is so lost in a sense of a relationship to God there. France, England, so little interest there. And here were people that went through such hardship, through such difficult things as God delivered their nations, but yet no interest in God. Jezebel was no different. When she heard what took place there, she was furious. And she put a target on Elijah and just basically said, I'm going to get you for this there. Nothing changed her heart at all. When we were at uh, uh, the Orlando uh, Samaritan's Purse Conference last week there, a fellow by the name of Frank Turek, maybe you've read some of his books. Um, I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. He's written a number of things. Powerful speaker, humorous, but just, just really nails it so well there. And he said, you know, when, you're, when we're, we're doing this talk with people and we're trying to show them truth and reason with them and present them with logic, he talks a lot about creation and all these sorts of things there. He said sometimes he just pauses and asks this question. He said, well, if the name was Joel, let's say, Joel, if I could prove to you that Christianity was true, would you believe it? 
Now, if the answer is no, he says that it's not an intellectual problem. It's a spiritual problem. It's a problem of the heart. Jezebel, through hearing, maybe she didn't, wasn't there to witness it, but Jezebel, through hearing, knew that something very, very powerful had taken place. Yet she rejected it, and she would not accept it because she had a deep problem with her heart. She saw a miraculous event took place there, but she could not believe. Ahab, not at that moment, but later on, had that pivotal moment when uh, a prophet spoke to him and says, life is over for you, buddy. I'm just going to tell you right now. Ahab fell in repentance and fasting and mourning, and God spared him that judgment that he had just uh, stated through that prophet and gave him a new lease on life, if you will. Unfortunately, Ahab still kind of drifted back to compromise in his life there. But if a person does not believe, it's, it's just very simple asking the question. If I could prove to you what was true about Christianity, if, if, would you believe it? And if the answer is no, understand. It's a heart problem. Don't go back and try and get more books to prove it and that sort of thing. Their heart is not right with God, has no desire to know God here. That was the situation of a Jezebel, and I think we do need to understand that even in miraculous moments, in moments of truth, it may not change the direction of a nation, or it may not change the direction of individuals there. There's another observation I made here, and I call it, <clears throat> each of us might need a broom tree experience in life. A broom tree experience in life. Um, I know you think I'm a little nutty on that one there, but let's look at this here for a minute here. Um, verse 4, chapter 19. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. And he prayed that he might die and said, It is enough. Now, Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my father's. Then as he lay and slept, and again, it's mentioned specifically there a second time, a broom tree, suddenly an angel touched him and said, Arise and eat. Then he looked, and there by his head was a cake baked on coals and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for you. So he rose and ate and drank, and he went in his strength in the strength of that food, 40 days and 40 nights, as far as Horeb, the mountain of God. And there he went into a cave and spent the night in that place. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him and said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? So he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord God, God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant and torn down your altars and killed your prophets for the sword. I alone am left and they seek to take my life. So let's back up here a little bit here. Elijah runs from Jezebel, and he heads and he finds a broom tree. Now, the first thing I think we need to remember, and I think all of us can testify to, especially those of us that are older, that um, we've all had these spiritual high experiences, right? I mean, for some of us, if I never did, but many people attended uh, promise keepers things there. I mean, these events were 75, 80,000 men together worshiping God. And we can look back to any, any moment in time and look at that spiritual high and I'm ready to, to go to battle with the Lord there and do everything. And it's what, a matter of a few days, we're back in the routine, the job, we're bored, we're, we're frustrated and this sort of thing. And we enter into that spiritual low. Now, Elijah had two significant moments in time here where God was working with him. One was that wilderness experience that we mentioned, first of all, when he went to the brook Cherith there. That was kind of that cutting moment, God doing surgery on his heart there. And there were several years in the wilderness. The second uh, experience he had was necessary for some recalibration. Mount Carmel was over. It had mixed results, as we know there. And I think Elijah, through the disappointment of knowing that there was probably not going to be major change or turning point here in this nation and people serving the one true God, he experienced disappointment and he flinched. 
he saw disappointment and he flinched. He fell into discouragement, maybe some frustration, and I think some depression. Now let's look at this broom tree for a minute here. Now a broom tree, I'm told here as I read, is nothing more than just kind of a shrub in the wilderness there. Nothing fancy, it's not a big oak, it's got all sorts of shade, but it does offer minimal shade. It was a relief from the oppressiveness of the sun there. And I think there's a lesson there, first of all. I think in these moments of discouragement, of disappointment or whatever, we ought to look for a point of shade. We ought to get away from the circumstance and find a point of shade, if you will, spiritual shade, so that we can kind of regroup here, get out of the heat, get out of the sun, and do some regrouping here. But there's a second significant thing about the broom tree. The broom tree offered warmth in the sense that it was great <clears throat> for building a fire. Its wood was very, very good for creating warmth in a fire. And it was also used, obviously, for cooking purposes here. And I think the broom tree, again, represents the concept of warmth in the sense of rekindling and preparing us for life, for that relationship, for that food we need, for that spiritual food we need there. And certainly, as I mentioned food there, uh, the roots, it's interesting here, the roots of a broom tree, although not terribly tasty, in fact, very bitter, it says that they were edible and they could be eaten there. I believe that that broom tree was a picture of sustenance, God providing some food for Elijah in these darkest of days here. It would be interesting, we don't have time and it doesn't work real good while we're streaming here, but to go around and share. Did, have you ever had a broom tree experience in your life there? And maybe that's something you share afterwards that you're talking to one another. Maybe a question to ask somebody there. But I think it's, it's so significant that here, again, we're at this spiritual high Elijah faces a death notice from Jezebel, and then he flees to the wilderness, but he flees and finds a broom tree to sit under. God using that to recalibrate him. Elijah was going into a period here of depression. What brings on depression? I am no expert. I've read very little about it, but I know I'm, I'm, I've met people, I've heard messages from people that I think would be surprised to hear that they had long battles of depression. I could be wrong, don't quote me on this. I believe Spurgeon alluded to that in his life here. Uh, there's a pastor in North Texas of a mega church there, uh, Tommy Nelson, that has written a book on this here. Heading a major church, but struggling with depression here. If you've read any of the books of Ron Dunn, uh, I think it's under the book When God is Silent, if I'm not mistaken here. Ron Dunn, uh, chariot, uh, Chained to the Chariot message there. Just a great old Baptist preacher there. I just love to listen to his messages. Long bouts with depression here. Depression is real. Depression is a battle we face there. Again, it could come at the end of a spiritual high there, a conference, a post-conference experience there, the end of revival meetings or whatever. I don't know if the Asbury event there has ended, but if it has, if it's tapered down there, I'm guessing some of those students are already looking back and saying, oh, I just kind of feel like I'm, I'm back in a rut here again there. Ongoing sickness and uncertain prognosis can bring on depression. For some, it can be a chemical imbalance even there. It can be boredom. Uh, nurturing the feeling of I'm unneeded, I'm unwanted there, getting caught up in lack of purposelessness. Or it could be even undealt sin, um, hidden sin in our lives. Or any one of these factors or a combination of them can bring us into depression. I think for Elijah there were several factors, one of feeling useless or ineffective, and perhaps even on a deeper level, one of being felt, feeling being abandoned by God there. So what do you do? What do we do when we face these moments of struggles, as Elijah did? 
as we, we get off course here, as we're fighting these battles. And again, I would suggest that maybe we need to find a broom tree in life there. Look for a place, a different setting to meet God. Separate yourself from the routine. And it doesn't mean you got to fly to uh, the mountains of Colorado and like that. I mean, it could even be here on campus or when you get back home. Find a quiet place, a park or somewhere, a room that you can get away and recalibrate. Secondly, I think it's important that we listen. And we see that in here. As he slept on the broom tree, suddenly an angel touched him and said, Arise and eat. He was touched by an angel. Boy, that would make a good TV show title, wouldn't it? Touched by an angel. That's for the old folk here. <clears throat> touched by an angel. Now, I want to say something here. It's significant. As I looked at that word touch, I thought, I'm just curious. Um, it, it could be a touch. It also could mean being struck or, or slapped or something like that. Now, I am not saying that this angel slapped him across the face, but I, I would not be surprised if it was more than just a Elijah, you know. He might have grabbed him or something and kind of shook him up and said, Elijah, hey, get with the program here type stuff. But regardless, it was an angel that confronted him and spoke to him. Don't let God, now we don't have, now again, I'm not saying angels do not maybe encounter us specifically. There may be those moments in life there. I can't say that I ever had one. There may be those situations. But what we do know for sure that God does encounter us with his Holy Spirit and God speaks to us with his spirit. And I would urge us to be listening uh, to the Spirit of God, to that subtle awakening, that rhema God gives us. A rhema, uh, it can be defined in a broad sense there, but basically, I believe a rhema is the Holy Spirit speaking to us particularly through a verse or a, a word or a chapter or even a book in Scripture there. I think for my own life here this last year, I think the book of Philippians has just been very huge in my life here. It's just got me thinking about things I've never thought about before there. So I would encourage us to be good listeners. Don't let Satan cut you off emotionally from conversation with God through prayer or his word. And that's often the first thing believers do. I'm discouraged, I'm frustrated. God's not speaking to me and the Bible gets set aside. Prayer life gets shut down. And I want to just say, fight through it. Fight through it. Read those passages, even if you don't get anything out of them there. Stick in the Psalms if you need to. Find a book like Philippians. Stay in God's word. Allow him to touch you with the Holy Spirit through his word. There's a documentary Carl and I watched a few months ago about um, I'm often I'm fascinated by these documentaries of uh, uh, passenger planes that suddenly encounter uh, something dramatic and how the pilot the pilots fought through this and in, in many cases brought them home safely in some cases uh, it was a sad ending but whatever it might be there but I really enjoy those stories because to me it's a story of leadership and a story of uh, tenacity. A particular story was um, uh, this plane is just flying normally there and all of a sudden there's this, um, they can't see anything. The pilots literally cannot, there's these flashes coming before them on the screen. It almost looked like surreal. Like they entered into uh, the twilight zone, if you will, here. So they're finding, well, what is going on? And all this stuff is coming. But what really was serious was uh, engine number one uh, all of a sudden cut out. And well, okay, we all know you can still fly a plane with one engine. I can't remember if there are four engines on this jet or not there. But anyhow, all the engines cut out. And they were fighting this thing. And where they had to land, uh, they could not make it. And they're fighting this thing. And they're very high. And of course, they're gradually coming down here. But what was significant about this thing was uh, the lead pilot uh, consistently, consistently said, I would have given up hope. I mean, they tried to fire up these engines a number of times. He said, do it again. And they literally 
went through the checklist that they always do. Dun, 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 yes, check, 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 nothing. And I think they repeated this process, even in the documentary here, probably 10 to 12 times. Now, I would have just been, try it again, try it again, try it again, just skip the checklist and go for it type stuff there. But he very calmly, I mean, there, there was some anxiety there, certainly, but this, this co-pilot consistently went through the procedure. And lo and behold, after, it was probably after 20, 25 minutes, the engine fired up and the number two engine fired up there and they were able to land safely. And I'll tell you afterwards what the cause of this all was here. But again, it was the persistence. When all hope was gone, and I'm, believe me, I'm, I'm a quitter. You know, and like, ah, it's, it's not going to work. Forget it. My wife will tell you, ah, just forget it. It's not going to work. Well, try this, try this, you know. Um, but he was persistent. And what I'm saying is, in difficult moments, in a moment of depression, and depression is very real, real, be persistent. Fight through it. Go through the checklist again. Stay in the word. Fight through it. Don't let Satan win the battle by putting the word aside or putting your prayer life aside there. Follow commands, respond, listen, and obey the simple commands. What did the angel say? He said, arise and eat. There's a journey ahead here. Now that's got physical implications. It's got spiritual implications as well there. There was a journey ahead. He did need to eat those coals that were baked. And maybe those coals were baked by the roots of that broom tree. Who knows there? But he needed to eat. But I think also it was the idea of the spiritual food and the spiritual. Who is the bread of life? Jesus Christ. Who is the, the water that gives life? It's Jesus Christ, the living water. Respond and eat. Again, don't neglect your relationship with him, even in a difficult time. I think there's another observation. I said, I think we can expect to hear the reminders. Don't procrastinate when God speaks to us and says, do this. Follow this, eat this, rise and eat. There was a second reminder to do this. I think we need to fight off the temptation to hit the snooze alarm in our emotional and spiritual life. And I think we do that, don't we? Well, I should get up. I really feel I should get up and study the word. Bang, I'll do it in, in 10 minutes. And we hit it again and we hit it again. Or we're struggling. Yeah, I know. My friend has just called me. He says, read this passage, read this book. I should do it. The book gets aside, we ignore it type stuff. Listen to the reminders there. And then observation, again, I've got number seven here. I don't even know where we're at in this observation list there. But proceed with the faith that God has given, great or small. It says that Elijah went in the strength of that food for 40 days on a journey. Now, it doesn't say he might have found food along the way there. But there's two interesting things to observe in that. The journey that he was called to do was not a 40-day journey. They said that if you look at the maps, Elijah could have easily walked from where he was to where he was commanded to go easily in 10 days. What does that tell us? Well, first of all, I think the 40 days uh, was maybe a picture of the 40 years of uh, you know, the Israelites wandering in the wilderness. But I also think it's a picture of Elijah was still struggling in his faith. I think he was wandering. I think he, he spent two nights in a spot. He didn't get out of bed. He just was struggling in life here. And I think we do need to proceed on that journey. Move with purpose, even if it is with a spiritual limp in our walk there. Next observation, embrace the waysides along the way, as, much, as rough as it may be. Elijah ends up in a cave, as we know there. It was not the comforts of the widow's chamber there, the upper room. Um, God will bring us to those caves in life, and we need to listen to him. Now, again, we know as the story goes on, I'm going to talk here, it was a dramatic display of what God's power, if you will. I believe their first was this strong wind. Rocks were literally explode, exploding. That must have been some wind there. There was this, these powerful events 
that took place, but I believe God took him to a cave so he could listen to a word from him. For us, it might be a message, whether in church, a podcast, some sort of revelation a friend shares with us, whatever it might be there. It often comes in unexpected moments, unexpected circumstances. We look at the life of Saul, who became Paul. I don't think Saul was on that road thinking, hey, I can't wait. In 10 minutes, I'm going to have an encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. Jonah wasn't looking for God in the belly of a fish. Balaam wasn't looking for God while riding a donkey here. God will give us these cave moments, if you will, to encounter us. And then I think we also need to be ready to answer hard questions and a bit of introspection. He was asked by God, Elijah, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? Basically, I was saying, how did you get? How did you get to this point of struggle, uh, depression, frustration, purposelessness, after you saw what I did on Mount Carmel? How did you get here? And I think we need to ask ourselves that question. If we're struggling spiritually, if we're having these battles in life here, and we're not growing, we have no interest in the Word of God, but yet we did. I, I hear that many times in you know, guys that went through basic. Man, I was never closer to God than in basic. Why? Well, the trials were hard. The pressure was great. But yet when the pressure is removed, we can become kind of lackadaisical. We just, eh, you know, it's, it's okay. I don't need that. Or when a sickness or like hey this could be yelzer you know suddenly my prayer life shoots up like this and everybody in the church is praying everybody knows about it and then we find out well it wasn't that it was just it was just a rash Whew. okay and before we know it we're kind of back into the the me lifestyle type thing here i need to think i think we need to ask ourselves the questions where are we what are we doing here where are we in our life there Elijah was feeling aloneness. He knew one was going through what he experienced, at least that's what he thought. There was a struggle with self-pity. Another observation then is we need to be reminded of the power of God. And we saw that. Here again was the wind, busted up rocks. Here was the earthquake, pretty scary. The great fire, not only at the altar of Baal, but here there's a great fire displayed. But yet, I think God already knew that these would not move Elijah. Why is that? And I haven't seen anybody in the commentary say anything like this, but I don't believe Elijah. He says, come out and see these events there. I don't think Elijah went out of the cave. And I think that's inferred here in the passage because it says when he heard the small voice of God, it says he came out of the cave. So I think his depression, his struggles were so great was he was just saying... I've seen it all. Even that doesn't move me, God, here. But that quiet voice was intriguing to Elijah, and it brought him out of the cave. I would encourage us to be praying for that still, small voice. Don't look for the big events. Don't, don't dream about, oh, I remember when I was at then, and uh, man, the brotherhood and all this kind of thing there and the excitement and the singing and that sort of thing. We came away from a conference where there was just great, great preaching, uh, tons of fellowship, just being able to share hearts with one another, great stuff. And that's behind us now. Now, fortunately for us, we have, we have something to come to. I can tell you, a lot of those volunteers are, they have no church to go to. And that's, I think that's part of that they're bad. I don't think, I think their church they feel is the Samaritan's Purse body of volunteers type thing here. We are blessed to have someone to come back to, but yet um, it's important to understand that we don't look for the dramatic. We don't even look for the, for the answers first in the fellowship of the body of believers because what can happen often is we can get just caught up in the activities and then yet there's going to be that moment of aloneness. Sunday morning worship only lasts for so long. And then we do have to face that reality of quietness there. So listen for that small voice of God there. And then answer the question. Because he was asked a second time. And he said, and, and again, Elijah basically, Elijah gave the same answer. He says, well, I've done this, this, and this, and I'm alone. I'm the only one. 
that is here on earth to respond to the sin around us. And then listen and move with purpose when God redirects us here. Move with purpose when God redirects us. After this experience in the cave and the still small voice and maybe the debate between God and Elijah of where he was and why he was where he was, he said, move on. I've got something new for you. He was to anoint Haziel king over Assyria. He was to anoint Jehu as king over Israel. And then most interesting and significant, he was to anoint Elisha as a prophet that would replace him. Elijah was given new purpose. He was given the opportunity to mentor someone else there, a companion to come alongside him. I think that's powerful, and I think that's something we need to remember. I was talking with uh, Jack Monday and his wife, Bonnie. Jack Monday has been here on campus. Years ago, he led Sharing Hope in Crises, a Billy Graham uh, evangelism type course here. And uh, since that time, he has retired. So I asked his wife, um, she was sitting with a very sweet gal there, and I said, so Bonnie, what's, what's Jack doing now uh, in retirement? Because he has retired from that. And she says, oh, don't call it retirement. Jack says he is being repurposed for God. I like that. We are being repurposed for God. And I, you know, I think of our sowers here and that sort of thing here. Um, yeah, I'm guessing most of them are probably retired. I think you almost have to be retired to do the kind of work you do. But you're not retired, right? You're repurposed. I think you see that. You're taking your skill set, whatever God has given you, and you're using that for God's kingdom. Be ready to be repurposed for God. And then finally, and I'm sorry I've gone so long here. Whoa, we need to wrap this up here. Is number, <clears throat> we find it in verse 18, remember that we are not alone. There's one more thing God wanted Elijah to know. He informed him that there were 7,000 others who also had not bowed the knee. We are never alone in our stance with the Lord Jesus Christ. Good lessons, I think. Good thoughts here from, uh, not my thoughts, but good observations, I think, in the Word of God here as we look at the life of Elijah. The struggles he had, he was, if ever a guy was just like us, it's Elijah. And we think, whoa, not alive, no Elijah. Well, we see it. Very, very similar battles that we have here. Praise God for uh, his patience with Elijah, his patience with us, and may we live with purpose and not allow Satan to discourage us or distract us from the ministry ahead. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you for the life of Elijah. And thank you that you did not give up on him. Uh, Lord, we recommit ourselves to you. We would ask that um, you would show us that we'd listen to that, that small voice uh, that proclaims uh, your truth to us. May we find our hope in you. May we not let discouragement uh, conquer our spirit, but rather may we be more than conquerors, overcome and live lives for purpose for you. I ask this in your name. Amen.